On today's edition of Creative Corner, we'll be reviewing the book titled Leading from the Streets, Media Interventions by a Public Intellectual from 1999 to 2019. Now, the book is a compilation of compelling articles written and published in the mass media by the author Magnus Oyeve between 1999 and 2019, spanning the entire range of Nigeria's social, economic and political life. Now, Magnus Oyebe is a public policy analyst, media columnist, and also an author. Oyebe was a broadcaster with Niger Television Authority and a two-time commissioner in Delta State. He's the founder of Inspire Group, which comprises of Inspire Realtors Limited, Inspire Media Services Limited, Inspire Consultant Limited, and Inspire Auto Services Limited. Magnus Oyebe, fellow of the Nigeria Institute of Management, Institute of Credit Administration, Institute of Strategic Management, and Institute of Information Management of Nigeria. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Good to have you here on the program. Thank you for having me. Yes, interesting book, this, leading from the streets. But I wanted to ask one very interesting question first off. What exactly is the challenge for leadership in Nigeria, especially when it comes to democracy? Yeah, um... <clears throat> From my perspective, leadership in Nigeria is uh, fraught with uh, the leaders on the corridors of power not being really in touch with the leaders on the streets, which means I'm saying that um, <clears throat> the leaders are often disconnected, you know, uh, from the people, and uh, that's reflected and evidenced by the policies that they make, which uh, actually sometimes um, do not reflect what the people really want. And um, the policy makers, you know, ordinarily should be listening to the people from the streets. Because uh, as the saying goes, uh, voice populi, voice they. The voice of the people is the voice of God. But uh, very often, uh, the people uh, in leadership, uh, especially from the corridors of power, uh, lead without uh, carrying the people from the mm -hmm. grassroots level along. And uh, we're saying that should change. And we're also trying to empower people on the streets as the real leaders. Like we're, we're a country of about 220 million people. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people in leadership are actually probably less than 5%. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, the rest of us, uh, Nigerians that are on the street, actually should find a way of uh, putting our views across to the people in leadership. And the people in leadership from the corridors of power should also find a way to key into what we want, or to sell their concepts and ideas to us so that we can be carried along. And this can be done through communication. Your book is a compilation of over 70 articles that have been published between 1999 to 2019. Mm -hmm. That is meticulous. How were you able to follow through and be able to see through? Did you have the, the vision all the way from 1999 to decide, I'm going to compile this or write this? When did it start? Walk me through the journey. Yeah, you know, that's the question I'm asked often. Actually, it's over a thousand articles written. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So 77 of the articles were selected. And uh, it took a lot of effort to do that. And they were put into seven chapters reflecting different uh, socioeconomic uh, aspects of Nigerian life. It took a long time to be able to put them in perspective. The, and, and the reason, lots of people have been asking, why do we have to re, re, uh, put the book, uh, the articles that we have written and published publicly into a compendium of sorts? But we have explained that the reason is that most of the things that we wrote about 24 years ago, nearly 25 years since the return of independence, still are still, they still, are still with us. Mm -hmm. you know, we've been running and standing in the same spots. You know, so it's, so most of the things that have been happening are like deja vu to me. Mm -hmm. you know, that I discussed these things, I wrote about these things in 2002. Take the issue of decentralization of the police force, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, 2002, I wrote an article, it's there in the book, that this should be done. And it, it was not um, heeded. You know, my call was not heeded. And I am not the, uh, the, the originator of that concept. You know, the former president, Ulysses Gombasa, actually proposed it in 1999, when all these things started happening, this insurgency and stuff. And they, in fact, his Minister of Information, Dr. Shavumi, actually made a pronouncement that the processes were going on. You know, but the states didn't like it, and uh, the entire system didn't like it, and they even threatened to impeach him. So he, he let it go. And can you imagine if the police was decentralized in 2002, 
you know, and it was deja vu to me that in 2024, the states and the federal government have just agreed that decentralization should take place. If it had happened in 2002, that's about 22 years ago, perhaps we would not have the insurgency that we have right now. We won't have the, we won't have the bandits issue, we won't have the herders and farmers issues that we have right now. Because local police would uh, entail that um, uh, people in the community are integrated you know, into the into the police force and living and with the people and whatever. So it's like the sheriff's yeah, absolutely. It's like the sheriff system in the United States mm -hmm. of America. Mm -hmm. They're local. They live there and whatever. They know who's coming and who's going out. So they could have nipped these crimes in the board before they got to the uh, level that they have reached now. Twenty-four years after thank God, you know, they have come to. Um, a reasonable agreement mm. that there should be state police. That's just one aspect. There are so many. If you go through um, the book, you find a lot of things that we should have done a long time ago. So, I, wanted so to talk that, so, so ahead, we, please, we I wanted to ask then what served as a criteria to be able to, to see about all of these um, articles? Because you said <coughs> a thousand plus. A thousand that is a lot to be able mm -hmm. to see through and read them through mm -hmm. and to be able to compile them and be this uh, book that we have today. Yes. We, we actually have a, a compendium of all of them. I have a, a personal website called magnum.ng. So most of my articles are in there. So we have to sift through them and put them in pockets, in what they call chapters or in segments. You know, so we put them together. But it took a lot of workshopping. Workshopping means me and my team, we sat down and looked at what, which one is right, which one is proper, which one should go here, which one should go there. And we looked at all these and said, OK, fine, let's put them in seven chapters. I'll, I'll tell you, uh, for instance, the, 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 the one that, that gave us some challenges, the one on insurgency. And you know how it is, religious issues and stuff like that. You know, so we wanted to be balanced. So we had to take afterwards from uh, a Christian perspective and from a Muslim perspective. For the Muslim perspective, we went to Sheikh Gumi, who had to sift through all the articles in that chapter, and went to, uh, to Primate, uh, Primate Nicholas Oko of the Anglican Church, who also looked at it from the Christian perspective. And Incidentally, if you read through the book, you see both gave very balanced views. Mm -hmm. You know, Gumi, as radical as people think, actually thought you know that the issues were properly dealt with. Because in some of the articles that I wrote at that time, I said we are all guilty of some of the things that are happening with respect to religious insurgency from the Islamic people. That before these things got to the street and they got really bad, these people, these people who are in the bushes now fighting us, were in the mosques. They were in our homes, they were in our environment, complaining. In our common their, areas. Absolutely. Their complaints were probably, not, were, were probably not well dealt with. Hence, they took it to the street. And it now got to this level. Thank God, you know, we're trying to do something about them. So, mm. And we, our approach has also been skewed. We've been doing kinetic things, maybe because the past presidents we have had were S soldiers. Mm -hmm. You know, General Lushego, Ambassador General Buhari. So they think that the solution to uh, a problem is to use a big hammer, you know. And as uh, the former president of, uh, of, of the U.S. said, Mr. Barack Obama, he said if we use a big hammer to be hitting every nail that we find, we will tear everything apart, you know. So they were using big hammer. There was not enough non-kinetic approach to it, like engaging with the people and trying to find out what the issues are, what you know, so which is what they just adopted now because yeah. every day you hear kinetic and non-kinetic and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> they should have used non-kinetic much earlier than now. Yeah, negotiation, talking it through with the people. <coughs> very interesting book. This is very big, by the way, and I'm sure that uh, everybody's going to enjoy this, especially journalists. One part of the book I found very interesting, your part two, which talks about politics, politicking, and politricking. Absolutely. Which highlights the sheer manipulation that goes on inside of politics, not just in Nigeria, but the rest of the world, the, the rest of Africa, mainly. Yeah. I mean, Kagame is in there perhaps maybe till 2034. <laughs> uh, there's, there's, there's so much going on inside yeah. of River State with mm -hmm. Nielsen Weekes still, well, mm -hmm. uh, allegedly there. having his uh, talents inside of River State. Mm -hmm. Now, for you, what are the, what's the theme that runs through African politics that, and, and the challenges that it poses, especially for democracy here in Nigeria, when you're coming from the perspective of leading from the streets. Mm. Incidentally, I was talking to somebody yesterday. Mm -hmm. You see, politics is the same all over. That is true. That is it's very not, true. It's not so unique <laughs> to us. It's just that it's a little bit more sophisticated when you get to the Western world. Look at what's happening in the United States of America. Look at what happened in their parliament. 
People are practically, you know, going to punch each other. <laughs> Taylor Green and the rest of the people and whatever. You know, so they, they are all covering their backs and, and the environments and stuff like that. What's going on in the course right now with respect to, um, to Trump. Trump could have been resolved a long time ago. They shouldn't even be doing what they're doing right now as they're getting and to the elections. election. It's becoming obvious to everybody now that they are throwing the kitchen sink at him to stop him because he has the potentials to win, mm -hmm. you know. But they could have resolved this thing. You know, if you recall, the House of Representatives impeached him. The Senate didn't impeach him. The House of Representatives was controlled by the Democrats, you know, okay? And the Senate was controlled by the Republicans. So you can see the partisanness in it. So, you know, so... but. When we, we sit down here or they talk down at us that uh, we have to do this, we have to do that, they're as guilty as we are. They're just more sophisticated in the way they manipulate things. So that's the reality. So politics is, as I described it, is politics, politicking, and politics. It happens across the government. Every time, everywhere. It's just that in the Western world, advanced society is more sophisticated than it is here. You know, so that's just the... Big difference, you know. But with respect, you just mentioned Wiki and Co and whatever. I think what should be done on our leaders, politicians these days, is that you know what hasn't happened is to you know hand over the governorship of the state to your wife. <laughs> it, it has happened between cousins, between uh, you know stuff like that. As and sons and, and, and fathers. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So there's absolutely no reason to you know try to think that you know when you leave, you know your surrogate would take care of you or protect you. It's only temporary. Mm. You know, that in Kwara State, for instance, uh, in uh, Kugi State, for instance, the governor went to protect uh, the, his uh, boss, the outgone governor, mm -hmm. when the EFC was going to arrest him. And what. That's the, 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 much, the most protection he can give, you know, that he covered him up and he escaped from the place. You know, but beyond that, he, in fact, that kind of bond and uh, loyalty may even break down in the next one year, you know, and stuff like that. So the best thing is to just do your best <clears throat> and hand it over to the next best person to do the job. Forget about trying to protect you, know, you looking for somebody, your surrogate or, or a front or something or whatever, or trying to have a third term you know, by putting somebody who is pliable or somebody who they call mumu that you can manipulate. There's no mumu in this thing. As soon as you become the governor and you have the power to do and undo and you have a lot of resources behind you, you develop Dutch courage, and you, you challenge you know, whoever wants to uh, impose or, or, or bring you down, you know, or, or talk to you in a manner that you don't accept. That's the reality. And it, it has taken this long for us to begin to see the reality. That is not uh, if obfuscation of the reality by thinking you know, that when you plant a surrogate, it will protect you. It, it hardly works. Mm. Um, this isn't your first book. This is pretty much your third book. Your fourth. Your fourth book. Mm -hmm. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, there's one on presidency and leadership as well. This mm -hmm. is also in leadership. Mm -hmm. And um, oftentimes I see the same theme running, which is leadership, mm -hmm. besides the one on grief, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, yes. um, we're not going to get into that it's for the sake of... It's my personal memoir. It's yeah. a personal memoir. Mm -hmm. uh, but leadership, you, mm -hmm. your, your theme has always been leadership. Mm -hmm. And um, it makes me wonder about the role of a writer mm -hmm. in documenting history. Mm -hmm. You compiled um, articles and op-eds mm. from, from 1999, and yet these people, and all the people who wrote these articles are big names mm. in, in, in the media space, mm -hmm. you know, from, uh, I, I don't want to name names, but mm. if you pick up the book, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But yet, we still haven't seen changes in our leadership, you know. It's still the same. Are authors and writers, are we doing enough as, 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 you know, as media practitioners, as media and, and intellectuals, you know, public analysts, are we doing enough or our leadership is just deaf to the cries of the people? Uh, I, I think the point is that the leadership is deaf to it. As, as a matter of fact, this question you, you, you asked, our colleague um, Ruben Abate asked the same thing. So that he's very excited to know that I think that politicians are listening to us you know, the agenda centers. I said, yes, they are. And I listed a lot of things that I, issues that I raised and points that I made that, you know, um, they listened to, you know, and uh, he wasn't so optimistic, you know, but in going through it, he said he was really impressed that I thought that they listened to us and whatever, you know. I'll give you, for instance, the last administration had a three-point agenda, 
fighting corruption and stuff like that, whatever, you know. And I kept insisting that they were wasting time, that you cannot fight corruption if you don't stabilize the economy, because you need the resources, you know, to be able to do it. And along the line, they changed to nine-point agenda with securing the economy as point number one, not fighting corruption. Because fighting corruption, as it were, was like, you know, a bull running into a China shop and everybody, everything just got crashed. Mm. We suffered two recessions and stuff like that. I said, no, let us stabilize the economy first before we can now look at corruption. And I also, you know, so I'm glad that in this administration, I wrote an article in 2016 that we should fight corruption with technology mm. and people. And just about two or three weeks ago, the special advisor to the president on uh, monitoring of projects, you know, uh, Hajia um, Balausman you know, uh, just came up with an app mm. that people can use to track projects, projects that are going yes. on. Uh, and Eagle Eye? I can't exactly, remember the name. Something like that. Some, yeah. You know, to use to track issues and whatever. So we should rely more on technology. Does this make you feel like Nostradamus? I do feel like Nostradamus. <laughs> in fact, that's what people are saying. Because I actually am in the other book that you just mentioned, yes. Becoming President of Nigeria. Sure, yes. In 2021, I pointed out that the presidency of Nigeria was going to be contested between the current president and the vice president. And it happened. That I wrote that way back in 2021. The primaries were held in 2022, 2023, you know, and stuff like that. So it, it, it was like, but I, I, I do trend analysis. You know, I look at issues, I look at the trends before I came, I come to... It, it figures, it figures. And regarding corruption, which you only just talked about now, mm. I wanted to ask what the role of international organizations or countries could be and how cooperation from uh, international our buddies can actually help Nigeria fight corruption. Mm. It's that simple. What's, what's the answer to that? Yes, the answer to that is that, you know, they, they have uh, different organizations fighting corruption globally. Take Transparency International, for instance. Mm -hmm. The person who wrote the afterword for the chapter on corruption, the chapter is titled Corruption and Unending Fight Against It, because I traced it back. Yeah, that, was, that, that was actually the, the name of your, one of the parts of your book. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you, you know, before independence, corruption was being fought. The colonialists, you know, indicted very important people from the sage of Bakumi Awolowo to Nandi Azikiwe to the Sultan of Sokoto. So is it culturally the, the entrenched Sadana, in us as know, Nigerians? It's not, corruption is not peculiar to us. There's corruption all We seem to have it bigger than everybody else. Even in the United States of America. You know, it's the system that stops corruption. I'm, I'm sure you are aware of the of the legislator, the member of the House of Representatives, that's under probe right now. Mm -hmm. He took, uh, you know, bribe allegedly, yeah, allegedly it has not been proven, and, you know, and stuff like that. So it's a system that can stop corruption. So that's why it's a good thing that technology is being adopted right now. You know, if you adopt technology, it will be able to checkmate, to stop things and whatever. Let me take simple acts of corruption, for instance, the traffic offense. Because there's no system, so the policeman or the last man or whatever stops you, and all you need to do is to uh, appeal to say, just sir, mm -hmm. you know, or please, sir, whatever you and stuff like that. And when you ask you to bring money and you give him uh, 5000 or 10000 and he tells you, oh, no, driving in uh, one way costs 70000 and you know, you look for a halfway through and stuff like that. But out there, because there's technology, if it's the camera that has captured you or anything or whatever, you get a ticket. Because your, it's centralized. Your license, your license plate, mm -hmm. plate number of your car, is linked to your license, your driver's license, and there's an address. So you receive a bill, and you just go to the nearest place to pay. But if you think, you know, they accuse you wrongly, or the, or, or the offense is wrongly charged against you, you go to court. So you, you have to forgive me for, for saying that it's a cultural thing mm -hmm. here, because the reason why I attempted it cultural is that in this case, the Nigerian or African instance, it's not only just uh, the system that is rigged, it's also the people who are complaining that the system is rigged. I mean, you use the example of the uh, traffic offense, for instance. There's mm -hmm. the guy who's saying, ah, I can find my way out of this by just sorting this guy. Mm -hmm. And there's the other guy who's manipulating and saying, oh, it's 50,000 bots. Before 4 o'clock, if you bring 25,000, you I can will let go. You go. So mm -hmm. it's a culture. There's <laughs> a giver and then the, the, there's the taker. Absolutely, it's not a culture. If you give the white man the opportunity in the US, in England, he will do the same thing. It's the system that captures them. Corruption, the term 
or graft or whatever it is. It's not Nigerian. It's not so African. it's human nature? It's, a, it's human nature. You have to find a way to police. That's why I'm just saying. Fighting corruption with people, power, and technology is a whole chapter. You know, as I just said, you know, the, the, as we are now moving into technology, you know, of course, we may not or we couldn't have been able to use technology more effectively earlier than now because of poor power uh, supply, because technology is supported with power. Okay, you know, so we are, even if we say we generate uh, 12,000 kilowatts right now, 12,000. Uh, megawatts right now we 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 we, we, we have less than four thousand available you know so technology may not be up and going all the time you know but as this power thing grows gets better we should rely more on technology because if the camera captures you and you get a bill in your phone or whatever mm -hmm. and it says go and pay xyz amount of money for beating the traffic or for doing this or for doing that you don't have a human being that you're going to go and say, hey, Jossa, or appeal mm. to, or give 10,000 naira bribe or so, whatever, you know. You just pay. And if you're not satisfied with the way, you go to court. And the judge will rule whether you're guilty or not guilty. And if they hit your pocket, if you keep paying these bills, and it also reflects in your license, the next time they're going to uh, renew your license, they look at the infractions, and it will affect it. And whether you be careful when you drive there. And so, as simple as that. You know, so technology. So, consequences people, to their actions making sure you met out those consequences and Absolutely. they learn from it. Absolutely. So it's not our culture. You know, it's not our culture. It's a human thing. And now that you're saying it, I, I, I see it from your perspective. And mm -hmm. I'm like, hmm, is it us, really? Because then it's under, I would say there's epigenetics that plays into it that we have now been morphed and warped with our system Absolutely. to the point where we now think that it's a culture. Mm. But away from that. Mm. Um, I, I caught your sub there, but it's OK. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's OK. That was directed at me, wasn't it? No, it was it's not. Okay. No, it's you, not. The no, guilty run not. at Wendell it Mass. It is OK. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, th this book, right, um, it was painstakingly done. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I must say congratulations. Thank you very I much. Must, I, I must lord this, this effort, because it's it's, uh, it shows that not only are you, not only do you care about the nation, but you also are attentive. So when you said you were also a trend, uh, you watch trends, it yes. makes perfect sense Absolutely. why you would compile this. Mm -hmm. But my worry mm -hmm. is, and I'm very passionate about education mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. literacy, that will people read? You know, will Nigerians read? How can we get Nigerians to read it? Because I always say that authors are, you know, authors and, you know, journalists and people who are the media are the custodians of history, and we must document history. But what is the essence of us documenting history if our people do not read, you know? Actually, this book was launched on the uh, 8th of this month at the uh, Alliance Francais, uh, Michael Dunga Center in Ikoi. There were a lot of dignitaries there. The, he was uh, the chairman of the occasion, was the... Uh, General Yakubu Gowan, the wartime president the full of, word as well. war, war time head of state of Nigeria, go on with one Nigeria. You know, it's uh, going to be 90 in a, uh, a few days' time. Yeah, a you know, days. so he graciously came to launch it. Um, we, a lot of uh, past governors, about four of them, uh, were there, and um, the uh, chief of staff to the president, uh, Right Honourable Femi Bajami Abela, was to be there. You know, but he was. His uh, boss, the President Bola Tinubu, uh, was returning to uh, Nigeria uh, on that eight, that Wednesday that the event was held. The Senate President was also um, supposed to be in attendance, but um, had plenary. They had just resumed, and they had plenary, and he was also going to receive uh, the Cuban ambassador to Nigeria on that same day in Abuja. So it was going to be difficult for him to scramble a plane to come to Lagos and mm, go back to Abuja. Back to the Vice President was also. Uh, meant to be there, but he had to be uh, stay back in Abuja to receive his boss, the president, who was returning on that day. Incidentally, uh, the, the person who was going to be the keynote uh, speaker is uh, Professor Wole Shoenka. Of course, you know him. Of the uh, uh, Nobel laureate. Exactly. And uh, who's uh, a human rights fighter, if you recall. It was going to be a historic event because uh, for the first time, um, General Yakubu Gawan, who put it very nicely, you know, he's a diplomat. He said, you know, that. Uh, Wale Shoenka was his guest, which meant he imprisoned Wale Shoenka for 22 <laughs> months, pre, pre the war, whatever, because uh, the, uh, the federal government alleged that Wale Shoenka was mingling with uh, the Biafran side, with Ujuku. He had a meeting with Ujuku and stuff like that. But Wale Shoenka, the point I'm trying to make is that he's, he's an intellectual, okay? Mm -hmm. And he was in his right 
trying to stop the war. He said he tried to mediate, you know, but in trying to mediate, he was clamped in jail for 22 months. You know all of this history because yeah. you read, because <clears throat> you document, Absolutely. and because you're in the media. Yes. Both Nigerians have, we're, we have amnesia. We're very, uh, our memory is so short-lived. Is it because we don't read? I'm going there. Yeah. I'm going there. You know, there's a general saying that if you want to hide something from a black man, so you see I'm shifting away mm. from Nigeria now, mm -hmm. or you, whatever. It's a black man generally, even in the United States of America. They say if you want to hide something from a black man, put it in, in the book. book. You know? I don't believe because there's no evidence. And so that's why when I published this book, I sent out over 200 copies to Nigerians, to leaders, to senators, to governors, to ministers, to people in charge of government generally, because there are nuggets of wisdom inside this book, as attested to by the people who wrote the afterwards. You know, yesterday's news is tomorrow's history. Yes, absolutely. You know, and the seven people, eight people who wrote the after, after was our authorities in the different segments. That's why I wanted to bring fresh energy well, sir. into the, the thing to enlighten people further. You know, so the 200 copies was distributed through GIG. I use GIG because I believe in Nigeria. Nigeria first. You have given them, yeah. you have given exactly. them free promotion. No? Exactly. Well, you know, you know, so I mean, I promote Nigeria. I like made in Nigeria. We, we can see your mm -hmm. endeavors and the fact that you have actually gone all out. You've done a lot. It's yeah. a very interesting book, this. And Mr. Magnus Ibe, thank you very much thank for coming so much on this morning to discuss thank it you. with us. And also, congratulations thank on uh, the launch of the book. And uh, we look forward to much more. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you so much. Yes, yeah. And that was Magnus Oyembe. He is the author of Leading from the Street. Thank you.